Hey, this is Joe Crane, host of Veteran on the Move podcast. And when I'm not helping veterans transition to entrepreneurship, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and today, Joe's mom laid down the law. The board games got so wild this weekend that she's declared prohibition in the basement. Hide the foamy beverages, kids, because the long arm of the law has arrived. So, to help keep you focused, how about cranking up the value of your investments? Today, we welcome the host of the hit podcast, Money for the Rest of Us, David Stein. Plus, October is Fire Prevention Month, so we'll stir in some good advice on protecting yourself and your stuff with Director of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute, Steve Kerber. But that's not all. We're splashing this show off with a voicemail from Stacy, who describes herself as a digital nomad. What's the best method to budget and plan her taxes? How should she be saving? And of course, I'll still hide a something something away for my trivia. And now, two guys who may or may not be noticeably less funny today, Joe and oh, J-J-J-J-G. I think not getting my daily dose of root beer is going to stop me. Heck no. We're going to bring it because it's Monday. It's ice cream. It's the ice cream that's not in your root beer that, that's going to stop you. It's, that's, that is, if there weren't is, vanilla ice is, cream. Is this plain root beer? What is wrong with this country? I said French vanilla. French vanilla. That would be something I would say. No idea what the difference is. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Root Beer Float for the Wind podcast. I am Joe Saul. See, hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And here for a glorious Monday, it's my good friend, OG. Oh, it feels like Monday, doesn't it? Oh, my goodness. Oh. Dragged me out of bed. Like, hey, let's do this thing. And I'm like, it's still dark. No. I ran four miles this morning. I love On beating. Purpose? I love Who's chasing you. There was, well, you know, if there's no root beer, if we're cut off, we got to, we got to go do yeah, something. Shakes. You got to do something. I got to tell you, I love beating the sun up. I love getting it out of the way before the sun rises. It's so awesome. Okay. He's good. like, That's one good of us. for you. You know what else I like doing on a Monday morning? That's saving money on those investment products I use every day. Big shout out to Magnify Money for sponsoring today's show. Magnify Money is the place where you've got over 92% of the finest and even the worst financial products, but they're all rated 92% of them in order. StackyBenjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money for more. Also, thanks to Masterworks for supporting Stacky Benjamins. Masterworks, because we are a fine podcast og and we like the finer things in life we are big fans of art the art that is podcasting but masterworks is the first art investment platform that allows you to invest in the world's most valuable paintings wouldn't that be cool if you could invest in the world's most valuable podcasts i feel like we would raise some capital if we did that <laughs> be like that uh, dude from WeWork. we'll just tell everybody that it's worth 50 billion Bada boom, bada bing. And there and, it is. And then when they realize it's not and they kick us out. We should talk to SoftBank. Then we get a billion. See if it's SoftBank could maybe uh, back our show. That'd be good. Visit, That'd be awesome. visit masterworks.io to reserve your shares. Back to talking about painting. We got a fantastic show today. We have not only the David Stein here to talk about money for the rest of us. Going to crank up those returns in our portfolio. And Steve Kerber from UL. You know how things say UL listed on them? It's time to help out your homeowners. Protect your stuff, OG. Well, and protect your life. How about that? Good fire safety tips on today's show. But first, we got a different headline. So let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. This headline comes to us from MSN News. Written by Brent Ahrens. By the way, Brett Ahrens is a columnist who I often absolutely love. Let's see if he keeps it up. The headline reads, Why $2,467 could be the magic number 
for emergency savings. Did you know that $2,467 is your magic number for your emergency fund? Sometimes I have that in my emergency fund, so it does seem pretty magical. (laughs) That's the warning, warning. (laughs) Brett writes, financial advisors have long recommended that people keep up to six months worth of emergency savings in case of unexpected medical bill or job loss. They crunch the numbers on more than 70,000 lower income households, and they come up with what may be the magic number for emergency savings accounts, $2,467. New research by Emily Gallagher, financial professor at the University of Colorado and an economist at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, and George Sabat, who's a financial professor at the Universidad Diego Portales in Chile. It's exactly how you say that. In Chile. The whole thing was exactly right. Yeah, I'm, I I got that perfect. Uh, say the amount of money you have to put aside for an emergency may also help predict how likely you are to use it. Quote, once you have at least $2,467 stored away for a rainy day, your probability of experiencing hardship in the next six months is low and saving an additional dollar doesn't seem to help reduce that probability very much, Gallagher told MarketWatch. Any lower than that may reveal other financial issues. When you have less than $2,467 stored away, say you've only got 500 bucks, your probability of near-term hardship is relatively high. And each additional dollar you save is associated with a much lower likelihood of hardship. I think I get where they're going here, which is that if you look at your account right now, not build it to 2400 but you just naturally keep 2400 you probably have enough cash flow coming in and out every month that your ability to withstand it via cash flow probably pretty good. Were they also saying that it's a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you have 20000 in your cash reserve, that magically you'll need $20,000 for something? I think maybe, but my main point of of bringing this up, why are people obsessed? And I know that this piece got a lot of clicks, not just ours and not just us talking about it today, but a lot of clicks because the nerdiest among us, as you've seen over the years, so obsessed with maximizing every dollar, that now we're going to talk again about maximizing your cash reserve. Well, you know, you, if you switch banks every three days, you can get 1.9 instead of 1.7%. So on your $2,467, that 0.2 adds up, makes a difference. He says sarcastically. I got gotcha. you. Oh, okay. No, I'm just trying to do the math. It's like the difference between, what, 96 bucks and maybe 97, 98. Well, that would be assuming that we are getting close to 10%. On 2,400? Right? 20, yeah. Two, so 1% is 2% 24 on, bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So multiply that by two. Didn't I say 48? Not exactly, but okay. What did I say? 96. Oh, uh, I went to 4%. Sorry. Aren't you in dreamland? Now with the economy as weak as it is, it would never be that high. It's funny. The first double went so fast in my head, I completely forgot it. I've already doubled it once because I'm fast. From $48 to $47 every year. Yeah, I can't. I I just have such a hard time even thinking about this stuff at this level because, and I know people do, and part of it's personality, I think, for me, that I'm kind of more of a strategic, high-level type, okay, directionally, let's go this way type of thing and believe strongly and action and and moving in the right direction will get us there versus going, well, $490 a month, get me to retirement or it'll be $492. It's like, why don't you just do 500 and make your life easy in the surrounding thing in your bank account? You don't have to think about, you know, rather than trying to optimize every single solitary dollar. And I get that that's our tendency, right? Different people have different tendencies. That's my tendency. Well, no, no, no. I'm saying other people have the tendency to worry about every nickel. And yeah. and that's fine. I think, though, we have to fight our tendencies and we have to think about efficacy. One of my favorite terms in training was always, what's the thing you can do that will deliver the greatest result, right? So I could teach you something, but is it really going to go anywhere? Are you going to use it? Does it matter? If I spend a unit of energy going from $48 to $49 versus using the same unit of energy to ask my boss for a raise where study shows that a lot of bosses want to give you raises, but you haven't asked, you're missing out. 
like you're being very inefficient with your time, which by the way, to the people that like to maximize every dollar, because I used to have a lot of engineers as clients, when you point that out, that yes, you maximize that dollar, but with the time that you spent doing that, you missed out on 40 bucks. That flipping drives them crazy, <laughs> Dr- drives them nuts. I was having this discussion, you know, we're talking about optimizing on the upside. I was having a discussion with somebody a couple of weeks ago about costs and fees and that sort of thing and, and recognizing that it's a thing. But I almost think that people use that stuff as a crutch to occupy their time so that they don't have to make the big decision. Using the example that you had, if I can spend the entire evening researching bank accounts that gives me, you know, 1.9 instead of 1.8% or trying to calculate the exact likelihood probability of a dollar emergency in my life, therefore figuring out that I need $2,467 in my cash reserve. If I can occupy my time doing that, then I don't have to do the more uncomfortable thing of writing a proposal for a pay raise or a promotion or doing the uncomfortable thing of cutting a large expense out of my house, right? I've got an extra automobile that I don't need or, you know, whatever. So those are the big decisions that have the big dollars attached to them, but are also the more uncomfortable ones to do, whether it's, you know, an opportunity to, to, to save more money or an opportunity to cut an expense. But if we can occupy ourselves in this low value, time intensive project, then maybe we can use that mentally as a block and go, well, I didn't have any time to do that. Sorry about that. Wish I could have gotten to it. And in our second headline, you know, we talk all the time about the financial things we can do to protect ourselves in the event of an emergency with insurance and with savings. But I didn't know this until recently, OG. It is Fire Prevention Month. And here to talk about fire safety is our new friend, Steve Kerber. He's the vice president of research for Underwriters Laboratories and director of the UL Firefighter Safety Research Institute. Steve, how are you, man? Doing great. Thanks for having me. Well, it is Fire Safety Month. What is the first thing we probably need to know to protect these things that we've worked so hard to have around us? Well, I think the biggest thing you need to know is that fire is very fast. And I think people don't give it a lot of credit and nobody thinks a fire is going to happen to them. So because of that, we want to educate people that you you don't have a lot of time to get out. You got less than three minutes to get out of your home. Uh, so there's there's a number of important things you need to do. Let's dive into them. I couldn't believe number one that I saw on, on the list when you and I were talking ahead of time, which is just closing your door before you go to sleep can make all the difference in the world. Yeah, it's it's free, doesn't cost anything, simple action, and it can absolutely save your life. So we've been burning houses for for decades now, trying to understand how to best protect people. And one of the things that continues to stand out is the fact that people behind that closed door, it's going to be a thousand degrees cooler, there's going to be air to breathe, and it's going to buy you very valuable time to be able to either get out or for the fire department to come rescue you. And uh, half of people die while they're sleeping in in our homes. So that's a critical time to close before you doze. And I like that phrase, close before you doze. I'd never heard that before. Uh, You and and I started talking about doing this segment. When we talk about, it's funny, we talk about insurance, Steve. We always talk about uh, have a plan before you need one, right? Most people get into, whether it's the market being down or something happens to a loved one, whatever it might be, people panic because they don't have a plan ahead of time. What are some of the things we can do to kind of build our fire safety plan ahead of time so we know that we're going to be okay if the worst happens to us? Yeah, perfect analogy. There's a number of things. First, you want to have an escape plan. You and your family need to know two ways out of every room and you want to practice it. A lot of people think, well, you know, I got smoke alarms and yeah, we're not going to have a fire and, and you don't talk about it until it happens. And then you absolutely get caught off guard and you don't have a lot of time to figure things out. Like I said, you got you got three minutes or less. And if you're woken up from a dead sleep, that's not a lot of time to figure things out. Uh, The second thing is smoke alarms. You get ahead of time. You've got to have those working smoke alarms in your home. You've got to have one in every bedroom. You've got to have one outside every sleeping area. And you got to have one on every level of your home, including the basement. And ideally, those would be interconnected alarms. So one on the other side of the house could go off, but every one is going to sound and you're going to be able to hear that and know you've got a problem and know you need to follow your escape plan. And then the close before you doze message, put that safety barrier, put that insurance in place before a fire starts 
So it can buy you that valuable time that you're going to need without smoke over your head and without that heat working to kill you. I want to follow up on a couple of those points that you made. Number one was you mentioned interconnected smoke alarms. So you like a smoke alarm system then much better than the separate alarms that I put the the little square battery in the back? Well, they're getting better. So there's a lot of alarms out there today that have wireless interconnection. Oh. So they all talk to each other. And if one goes off, they all go off. Uh, so even the battery ones are are much smarter today than they used to be. And then the second thing is, and, and this is, I don't know if this is a question or comment. I got to tell you, when my twins were young, they had a fire prevention day at school and then they brought home their material and our family went through the drill and I was actually a good time. <laughs> like, like, like knowing that, I don't know if it was because it was calming or because it was just a family group activity. It made us all feel good to go through this ahead of time. It was really, it was more fun than I thought it was going to be. I, but do you get that response very often? We do. People get intimidated by it because in many ways the kids go to school and they get the latest information from their local fire department and they bring it home and the parents don't know. They haven't heard it since they were in in elementary school. So it's a little bit of the kids teaching the adults, which is a a great experience. And then just mapping your house and and thinking it through of, wow, if if my living room is on fire because the cat knocked over a candle or an electrical short happens and catches the sofa on fire. We're used to going out our front door and that would be blocked. Now what? What do you do? Can you get out a window? Do you have a ladder to get out a window? Uh, and ultimately, do you know how important it is to, to have that door shut, uh, especially for parents? I can't think of a more helpless scenario than not being able to get to your kids because you're cut off by the smoke. Yeah. Wow. Uh, where can people go for more information, Steve? So two places, uh, closeyourdoor.org. That'll give you all the great videos to see the dramatic difference that the closed door makes. And then smokealarms.ul.org. You learn about all the new smoke alarm technology. Uh, You can get 10-year smoke alarms now, so you don't have to change the battery every time you change your clock, that they'll last for 10 years. And for people to know that they do expire after 10 years. So if you've got alarms that you've been putting batteries in for more than 10 years, it's time to get new alarms. And there's a lot of great new alarms out there. Well, we're as lazy as the next guys here in the basement. So I dig the fact that I can not think about it for 10 years. We'll have links to all of the the places that Steve mentioned on our show notes at stackybenjamins.com. Steve, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes in your busy day and talking uh, fire safety with us. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate the opportunity. Big thanks again to Steve for stopping by. Yeah, we we actually were doing this at our house. It was funny to me that it seems a pretty normal thing. Like it doesn't change the plan, right? If there's an emergency, there's a plan and you just do the same thing. And I asked my oldest, I said, so where would we meet? He's like, uh, uh, what do you mean? I said, where do we do the head count thing? But like, where do we meet? Because we got multiple exits. Where do we go? He's like, I don't, I don't know. I said, at the neighbor's house. We meet at the neighbor's house porch, right? Does that not, is that a thing? Oh, yeah, that would make sense. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I failed as a parent. My kids can't even lo- do a practice fire drill correctly. Well, you heard me tell Steve, but my kids love that. Do, do your kids yeah. like it, though, going through that drill? Uh, by going through that drill, do you mean actually doing it or talking about doing it? <laughs> and- I think somebody that's had a house fire... We would do it every three days, but, um, and we, and we have the answer right there. Obviously this has a lot to do with your homeowner's insurance and with your renter's insurance, but, but even more than that, just saving lives, probably more important than your insurances. I have an interesting story about this. Maybe we'll talk about it later. Uh, Maybe, but you know, one thing we need to talk about, which is we talked about maximizing your cash reserves. If you're obsessed with that, but to OG's point, you want to spend a lot less time. You know where you go to do that? You go to magnifymoney.com because magnifymoney.com is a place where you can very quickly find out where those highest interest rates are on checking accounts, savings accounts, and how to pay less interest to the man on your credit card debt or other debts like student loan debt. If you need a car loan, they're the first place to go comparison shop. Magnify Money is your one-stop shop, no matter what financial product it is you use. What I like best about Magnify Money, and if you head to, and I'm going to do this right now, stackybedjamins.com forward slash Magnify Money, the very first thing that it does 
is it just says, what do you want the best offers on? Balance transfer, cashback rewards, 0% interest credit cards, low interest cards, CD rates, savings accounts, checking accounts. Let's look at savings accounts. Click best personal offers. And it shows in five columns everything I need to know. The amount of money I'm going to save, the name of the bank, the grade on their fine print. So we don't want to deal with a bank that has a ton of fine print, the minimum deposit I have to have, and what the APY is on that. And as of uh, late last week, it was uh, 2.4, highest interest rate there on savings accounts at Magnify Money. So check it out yourself. That's in my zip code. They have different interest rates for different zip codes, but uh, check it out. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash magnify money, where it's easy to compare, ditch, switch, and save. All right. I think our lessons today, oh gee, time to stop talking about it. Time to put on your fire safety hat, my friend, and take everybody through the drill. Take the family through the drill, man. I think we have to. And then I the, agree. And then the second thing is stop overthinking your savings account. 2600 and something dollars, not really that relevant. I feel very lucky that I get to call this gentleman my friend. He, of course, has a top podcast, over 40,000 listeners per episode, called Money for the Rest of Us. He's received uh, tons and tons of, and frankly, in, in my mind, OG, this guy doesn't get mentioned enough for the great work that he does and the thought leader that he is. You've heard about him in the New York Times, Forbes, Chicago Tribune, U.S. News and World Report, and others. A lot of people don't know what he did before money for the rest of us, but we do. Prior to launching the podcast, he was the chief investment strategist and chief portfolio strategist at Fund Evaluation Group. They only managed $33 billion, OG. Well, I don't know what they did with all their free time. <laughs> only $33 billion. At FEG, co-headed the 21-person research group. He co-founded their $2.2 billion asset management division, where he developed its investment philosophy and process and was lead portfolio manager. His former clients include the Texas A&M University System, University of Puget Sound, Sierra Club. Today, we get to talk to him about his new book, where guess who you're going to find with a quote on the back of the book, OG? This guy. How about that? Here to talk about money for the rest of us. It's our good friend, David Stein. And coming down the stairs, he's back again. If we offered frequent flyer miles on this show, I think David Stein might have as many or more than any. How are you, man? I'm super. It's good to be here again. I'm so happy you're here with us. So doing a podcast wasn't enough. Had to do a book, too. I did because as a quote the other day, I read in a book called It Starts With a First Sentence by Joe Moran. And he basically says speaking is just like speaking to air, but a book is permanent. You're, you're able to carve your words that are going to last a long time. So yes, I wrote a book. Yeah, it's exciting. And now I feel like the bar's high. Like I need to do one. Someday, someday uh, I'll try to catch up. But let's let's talk investing, especially investing mistakes. And I like that in your book, David, that you start off talking about mistakes because as you know, every beginning investor hesitates because they're worried about making an investment mistake. But you begin your book talking about a big investment mistake that you made, which uh, turns out, how could buying your dream home actually be a mistake? Living in the dream home wasn't a mistake. That was enjoyable. The mistake was not doing due diligence on the gravel pit that had been abandoned for 10 years across the street that suddenly sprung to life into where we had dump trucks going down the road. Now, this is in Teton Valley, pristine, overlooking the mountains. You can't hear anything. And then you suddenly have this rock crusher going 12, 15 hours a day. But investing means making mistakes. And the key is to keep your mistakes small. Warren Buffett says we beat ourselves up too much over our mistakes. And we just have to recognize that we are going to make mistakes, but we need you know, successful investors have a discipline or framework for deciding how to invest or what they invest in. And one reason they do that, I and mean, that's really what risk management is, is it keeps their mistakes small. This, this was a bigger mistake than normal. And we ended up breaking even. We sold 
the house. We split it. It was, it was an 80 acre farm. We sold it. We split it into two parcels and we sold half of it with the house to a woman that's operating it as a kind of a dude ranch type situation. But it was a, clearly, it was a mistake. Well, you counter that mistake with, you also said another mistake that you made was that you didn't realize that the house was mouse infested and you invited an exterminator over who you, you point out a mistake that he was making with, with stocks as well. Well, we knew there were mice. We didn't realize there were dozens and dozens of mice. That <laughs> Families of mice. Sat, this house had sat empty for four years. So, you know, we bought at the bottom of the housing crash. We invited an exterminator over. He found out what I did. I podcast and I was an investment manager at one point. And he asked me, how much can I earn investing in stocks? And before I could answer, he says, I think 80% is reasonable. <laughs> and I said, 80%? And he said, yeah, that, that I just bought this stock earlier this year. And that's what I earned. His mistake is he didn't really understand how stocks work. He was anchored to 80%. That's what you earn. As investors, we need to understand what drives returns of any asset class. Just understand. I mean, it's one thing to forecast, but and, and that's very hard to do. But we at least need to know what the drivers are. And with stocks, it's driven by dividends. You know, the income stream, the cash flow, which, you know, in the U.S. is about a 2% dividend yield. So you're going to lock in a 2% return. How do you get the other 78%? <laughs> well, the second component would be the earnings growth. So over time, stocks grow their earnings, which means they can grow their dividend. And so that's a big component. Not many companies are growing their earnings at 80% a year or 78% a year. The third component is really what are investors paying for that dividend stream and that, that earnings growth. And that's the price to earnings ratio. So what, you know, what are they paying for $1 for their earnings? And so historically, the stock market has returned 9.5%. This is going back to 1926. Four percentage points was the dividend yield. You know, another four and a half or so was the earnings growth over time. So that gets us to eight and a half percent. And another you know, 0 0.8 to 1% was due to the stocks just getting more expensive over time. And so going forward, you know, just taking this exterminator, if he's in a broad-based ETF, like the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund, there's no way it's going to do 80% because earnings are not going to grow that fast because they tend to track the economy. In fact, typically they, they grow slower than the economy. That's why a reasonable expectation for stocks is closer to 6 to 7%, just based on those building blocks. And that's an important component as investors. Know what the drivers are. I feel like that guy's ruined. You know, his, his, his first expectation is so high. It's like a friend of mine took his uh, eight-year-old son to a baseball game, and he happened to get these tickets because of what he does from uh, Comerica Bank, from a big bank. And the game was at Comerica Park in downtown Detroit. And he sat the second row behind home plate. And, and he knew, he knew, my buddy Greg said, that his son was screwed the rest of his life. Oh, yeah. Because he sat the second row behind home plate <laughs> the first game he ever went to. This guy, 80%, he's, he's toast. Yeah, he is. And I don't know how it turned out. I mean, maybe he's brilliant. And he's just really good. But, you know, the other thing when it comes to picking individual stocks that I, I hammer over and over again in the book is the only reason you, you buy an individual stock is because you believe the market's wrong, that it has mispriced the stock because we don't buy a stock because it's growing fast or because it has cool products or because we think it's popular because every stock already has an embedded growth rate in it. I mean, that's how it's valued. It's a market with all these investors and they've come to a consensus. We think Amazon's going to grow at X percent per year. If it doesn't, then the stock's going to tank. And if it does better than what everybody already assumes, then it's going to do better and outperform the market. So we have to have the essentially the confidence and, and some would say the arrogance when we buy an individual stock that everyone else is wrong and we're right. And that way we're going to outperform the market. But if you look at a, an index like the S&P 500, you brought up the total stock market, doesn't it? makes sense that it's not going to be just one or two stocks are going to beat the market. There's going to be many of those stocks, maybe a third in a year, maybe half of them in a year beat the market. So I could, I, it could be a 50, 50 bet that I beat the market. Well, when you buy an index fund, right, it's made up of stocks that disappoint and stocks that do better than expected. And so those offset each other. And so at the end of the day with a broad based index fund, it's driven by the dividend yield, the earnings growth, and the change in valuation over time. 
So I'm, when I'm talking about the arrogance, I'm talking about you're just buying one stock. Sure. And you're saying this one. But if you're buying, I mean, that's the, when you, if you buy, let's say, an asset class, a segment of the market, let's say some segment gets very beat up and you can buy and there's 300 segments, let's say it's small cap value after a period, you know, it's done very poorly. Well, there's, you buy an exchange traded fund. There's a basket of securities that have a, a bunch of embedded positive, potential positive surprises as they do better than expected, because that's, that's why value investing works over time. Because as humans, we just get, we think bad things are going to continue for companies. And so if you buy a basket of cheap stocks, you don't have to figure out which one is going to surprise to the upside, but it's going to do better than you buy, let's say a basket of very expensive technology stocks that are priced for perfection. One is more likely to disappoint. You look at taking your note of small companies, small company value, where you're buying the stuff that's, quote, on sale versus growth, where you're buying the high flyers. Which one over long periods of time historically has done better? Value uh, by far, but it can go through very long periods of underperformance. Value stocks have underperformed growth stocks in the U.S. for 12 years in a row. That's a long time to be a value manager and you're losing clients and it's hard. But this is after a period where value did extremely well from 2000 to 2008 value just trounced growth. And over the long term, value does outperform because it's human nature. I want to get back to the guy in the $80 stock for just a second because I can't get that out of my mind. I I remember seeing studies. Maybe you saw these studies before. I don't know where I first saw it, David, if it was maybe uh, Rick Edelman quoting this about the study where they asked people, you own a random stock. Maybe everybody listening to this can play this game. You own a random stock. You buy it for $10 a share without having any more information. What price would you be happy with when you sold it? Have you heard this before? I've not seen that. No, no. Yes. You know what? I've the, not seen that. You know what the average answer was? You buy a random probably 100, stock for 10 bucks. 100, probably. Actually, actually, it's funny. People were a little more, a little better than you thought. It was 15. I buy it for 10. Oh, so a 50% increase. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want, but then of course, then, and I think it was Rick Edelman, pulls back and goes, like you just said, it's 50%. It's 5-0. And if the market would continue to do 10, let's say, you got a little while of holding that baby to get to the, to get to that. Well, yeah, but that's what you, you if you're going to buy one, I mean, I'm gambling if I'm buying one stock. I want a 10 bagger. Absolutely. You know, I want to sure, go 10 right. times my money. Yes. Yes. But happiness only starts at 50. Like, why do we have such unrealistic expectations of wanting the 10 bagger 50% or whatever it is? Why, why is that? Is it this? gambler mentality is it is it oh, yeah. investing in individual stocks is intoxicating it's fun but you do it with your funny money you don't do it with your retirement savings because the vast majority of investment professionals underperform the market I and mean, i spent close to 15 years researching money managers and trying to find the brightest minds out there who could predict the future and figure out which stocks are going to do the best and there are very very few that can do it because the more specific your prediction, the more likely you're going to be wrong. Something's going to happen that you just hadn't considered. And most managers, they underperform. Talking about some of the concepts that you bring up in your book or even on your show, I like talking about those through the lens of mistakes we made as investors. And I've made some whoppers. You've made some whoppers. But let's talk about your first one. What was the first individual stock you bought and why did you buy it? Sure. I bought a stock called Novell. And this, I was in graduate school. I was studying finance and I thought, Novell, this is a high flying stock. Computers are going to get big, computer networking. And so I bought Novell because I had worked there, sort of. I was a temp employee in Provo, Utah, and I would put together manuals for their leading product. So I just went out and I took 25% of our life savings, which, you know, was a thousand bucks or so. <laughs> and because we were newly married and I bought Novell. And then it, you know, on, it would show that the I think it was called the Business Hour on PBS every because there was no Internet at the time. And so the only way you could see whether the stock did well was it was on this television program. And it was one of the leading kind of growth companies. So it was always there. But I knew absolutely nothing about Novell. And this is an example of when we invest, we need to be able to explain what it is. I should have at least known what Novell did. 
Like, I didn't know what netware was. I mean, I own a computer. I said 1991. I didn't know the financials. I didn't know if it was cheap, expensive. I knew nothing about it. I simply gambled and said, I think this stock's going to go up because I think it's going to go up because I've heard of it. And, and, and <laughs> why wouldn't it go up? Because that's what stocks do. I got lucky. I should have stepped back and said, and what I would ask now is, what do I know? that the market doesn't. What's my informational edge with this stock that I believe the market is wrong? But I didn't, and, and it worked out. You know, we sold it, it did go up, but I, it was pure luck, if the, I, cause I had no idea what the return driver was, or what earnings or anything was. So it's funny because uh, very famously, a guy named Peter Lynch, who managed a big fund called Magellan said, buy what you know. And it seems like on a cursory level, you knew the stock, right? I mean, you work there, you knew the inner workings of the company, at least to some degree, probably more than a guy who just lives down the street or somebody, you know, who lives five states away. You're saying that's not enough. Well, no. And he says it's not enough. He says, you know, if you're like Starbucks, you don't just go, go buy it. You have to do some, at least some research, look at the financials and decide, you know, a money manager, that's what they do. Right. They're going to forecast earnings. They're going to do an earnings model. They're going to talk to the company management. They're going to talk to their competitors, the suppliers. They're going to try to believe, you know, and they're going to build out a whole model and say this this stock should be worth this, even though it's priced at that. I didn't do any of that. I had spent a few hours working in a warehouse, putting together their manuals about netware, most of which I didn't really understand other than, you know, I could put some rubber bands around the manual. But that's not a basis for investing. That is a basis more for just really throwing darts. I mean, that's what I did. I threw a dart and I bought a stock and I got lucky. If I'm buying then just the broad index, which you've been talking about for most of us, that's probably what we should do. You know, you talk about knowing what you own and being able to answer the question, what is it? Does that still apply if I'm just buying the broad index? Well, sure. It applies to, under to have a reasonable assumption. I mean, a lot of people, let's say, they retire early and they base their entire retirement on 10% returns for stocks because that's what they've done historically. Being able to explain what an investment is, one aspect of that is being able to figure out how much, what's a reasonable return assumption. And in today's environment, 10% return for stocks isn't reasonable because dividend yields are half what they were historically and stocks are priced way more expensive. And so we're not going to get 10 year annualized return for stocks over the next 20 to 30 years. Because the numbers, the what I call the math of investing and the emotion of, of investing. The math is, is the cash flow and the cash flow growth. The emotion is what investors are paying for that cash flow. And right now for US stocks, they're paying a lot of money for it. And stocks will likely, you know, a more reasonable assumption is, is five to 7% for US stocks. I like the idea you talk about writing out what is it for another reason, I mean, you just mentioned a couple, but the, another reason I like that, David, is because you also point this out in your book that it points out what you don't know. Like if you have to verbalize it or write it down, you'll more quickly see, and I don't know if it's the process of physically writing it that you see it or, or verbalizing it that you see it, but you start to see how much you don't know. And it makes you realize just how much more research you probably need to do before you buy. Well, sure. And they, they've done academic studies on this. When they've asked, researchers have said, explain something is like a zipper. Like, how does a zipper work? Verbalize that. It's not, well, these things kind of come together and people realize, well, maybe I don't know as much as I think I do. <laughs> so it humbles us. So be, to be able to explain an investment, you know, what are the drivers? Another question, who's selling it to me? Like, who's on the other side of the trade? We don't usually think about who's selling us the stock. Because you buy it on a stock exchange, but we have to understand who are the primary traders of stock. Who is who? Where's most of the trading activities coming from? Well, it's coming from algorithms at this point, or professional money managers. Which means when we're buying a stock, whoever sold it to us was probably a professional or an algorithm that knows way more about this company than we do. Which is a very different environment when Benjamin Graham, who wrote The Intelligent Investor, he was investing in the 40s and 50s. At that time, most stocks were owned by individuals. So he could outsmart other individuals. Much more difficult for us to do that today. 
You talk about the difference between uh, speculating and investing, and part of that being the fact that you know historically there's been some background behind this price. But when you think about it at the time, in the moment, investing and speculating, David, I think feel a lot the same because I think of, you know, if I'm doing the math on an investment in tulips in the 1600s, everybody else is getting this price. This price looks fantastic. At the very least, I think it can't lose money because person after person, at least for the last several months, has been getting this price. You look at Beanie Babies in the 1990s or Bitcoin two years ago, right? I mean, how do you avoid getting caught in one of these speculative traps? Even, you know, I mean, right in the middle of, well, early in my career, the tech wreck, right? You remember the whole thing about the new economy and the new math? Sure. We were The new math we were using, not like the math in high school, the math that it's like quantum physics. You have no idea how the hell this thing works, but hey, it works. It's new. Well, first off, a speculation is something where there's disagreement whether the return will be positive or negative. An investment, and this, these are some fairly narrow definitions, an investment is something that has an expected positive return. And why? Because it has cash flow. So bonds are investments because they pay interest. Real estate's an investment because you get the rent. Stocks are an investment because generally you get the dividends. But even if it doesn't pay dividends, ultimately there's earnings. A speculation is something like gold or Bitcoin or antiques or tulips. And they're Beanie Babies. They're not necessarily bad, but there isn't any way to value them to see if they're too expensive or not. It's just it will be worth whatever investors or other speculators are willing to pay down the road. And so the key is to keep less than 10 percent of your assets in speculations. Sure, you can buy. I got a friend that wants to buy the number two issue of Batman. It's fifty thousand dollars. Pure speculation. And and then there's the risk, you know, it's going to get ruined somehow or catch on fire. But I mean, it and he hasn't gone through with it yet. But that's an example of a speculation. Somebody needs to pay us more down the road because there's no cash flow. I love the uh, you have a quote. Uh, you write this quote from Ann Goldar in her book on tulip mania. You write that she writes of the speculative frenzy. Uh, after the fact, as happened in other financial crises in later centuries, it's easy to preach irrationality. But there was nothing intrinsically crazy about buying a product. It was clear one could sell at a higher price. I mean, I remember this December of, of 2017. Clearly, Bitcoin was I could easily find somebody who's going to buy it for more than what uh, than what people were buying it for at that time. Well, sure. In fact, I, I mentioned in my book, I when it, it went from 17,000 down to 10,000 in a month. So it fell 40 percent. And I, I had a guy email me and says, should he buy the dip? And a 40% decline is not a dip. You know, you get dips in investments because you can see there's a reasonable assumption that it will return to whatever price it was. But with spe speculation, there's no way to know where the bottom is, where the top, it bounces all over the place. And that's fine. That's just the nature of speculations. So we just, we can't just put too much of our assets in something like that. Speaking of that, I look at some commodity and I don't know then are commodities then speculation or investment. There's yes, no there's spe there's speculations. But yeah, there is no yeah. cash flow with commodities. Yeah, because when you're buying a commodity, you're buying commodity futures. Yeah. I mean, you can buy you can buy gold coins. You cannot buy a barrel of oil. Yes. Yeah, so you have to buy an oil future contract, which means you're promising to take deliver of oil in the future, which means there's a price. And when the way commodities work. In order to make money on commodities, it doesn't matter if the price goes up. It has to go up by more than what the contract was priced at. So if oil is at $60 a barrel, but you bought a futures contract at $64 a barrel, if oil two months down the road is only $63 a barrel, you lose money. The book is called Money for the Rest of Us. It starts off in the beginning of the book with the question we've been talking about today. What is it? And then what's the upside? What's the downside? Who's on the other side of the trade? And it, it goes from there. It's a fascinating read. David, where do we get it? Uh, you can get it at, uh, well, you can learn more at moneyfortherestofusbook.com. You can, uh, it's, it's an interesting book. It's being released in stages. The ebook will be available by the time this program airs. The uh, hard copy version got recalled by my publisher because they made a mistake on the cover on the dust jacket. Oh, good. And the, uh, and the audio book will be... <laughs> Available in December. So uh, this book is not going to hit the best Wall Street Journal bestseller list because you can't do that if you release 
your books and dribs and drabs over time. But there's that uh, limited supply, though. So act soon. Uh, if you, <laughs> there are a few copies at Barnes and Noble before they pull them off the shelves. Apparently. And then uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you about the podcast. What's coming up on the Money for the Rest of Us show? Well, Joe, you know that I record my podcast and then I release it the next day. And I have, I'm not like you that it's well planned out. I have no idea what's coming up on Money for the Rest of Us because I haven't recorded the episode yet. And it sounds so much more thoughtful than our shows, too. Why do I have a five week schedule and your shows always sound like they're much more thoughtful and like you put more into them than I did? You don't tell me that. I don't want to know. Well, no, there's an advantage to that, though, because so this week's episode was on these 10 questions. And the day I'm recording, I find out they're pulling the hardcover. They're going to recall the book. <laughs> so I could record that and release it. So I can, you know, it's a little more flexibility in doing that. David Stein, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes talking investing. Thanks for having me, Joe. Hey there, trivia fans. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And with Joe's mom declaring prohibition, we're on lockdown here in the basement. I mean, geez, it's like being in a penitentiary. Everyone's glaring at each other and staring at the root beer drawer over in the corner drooling at the start of the show that drawer was fully stocked but uh during the heat of that awesome david stein interview i am sad to report two beers are missing i don't know who the wise guy is but you and i both know it might be time to confront og and i'll admit to you please don't tell anyone but i also confiscated three for you and i well you know two for me and one for you you know who does all the work around here so like uh, anyone who has something to hide, let's focus attention somewhere else, shall we? How about we look at Joe's mom's crazy calendar? Let's uh, see here. Oh, yeah. Hey, today is World Animators Day. That's a great topic, right? So spin that around with a side order of money topics. And what's the question? <laughs> Try this one. What is the highest grossing animated movie of all time? I'll be back with your answer right after this. Big thanks to Masterworks for supporting Stacky Benjamins. If you're not familiar with Masterworks, it's the first fine art investment platform that allows you to invest in the world's most valuable paintings. What I like about Masterworks is that you actually are getting in on an asset class that historically most of us have not been able to get into because of the fact that these paintings cost a ton of money. And yet, when you pull back the curtain and you look back on these masters over time, the discussion is a compelling one. You look at the standard deviation, the ups and downs of artwork versus other asset classes, that's attractive. Also, the fact that you can directly own and pick which master you own instead of some of the art funds, which, by the way, I like those too, but I really like the fact that in this case, you can pick out the exact master so you know the history of how well that master's paintings have done. Everyone from uh, Banksy to Andy Warhol, Masterworks has invested in many of the great artists that even non-art lovers like. When we look at investment classes that beat the heck out of inflation, there's a compelling discussion here. Now, artwork isn't for everybody. Obviously, you own a physical painting and you can't sell a little piece of it to get your money out. So you have to know how this asset class works. While it's very exciting and it's something that I personally like, it's not for everybody. Even if art is the most popular investment of the ultra wealthy and it's among the top asset classes this last year. Here's how you check it out. Masterworks is giving stackers the opportunity to bypass their huge waiting list. Head to masterworks.io and then let them know Stacking Benjamin sent you and then you'll skip the wait list. That's masterworks.io and then put in Stacking Benjamins to learn more about Masterworks. Happy Animators Day, everyone. I gotta tell you, Prohibition is really making it tense down here. Everyone's on edge. OG's giving me the stink eye, and 
I'm fairly certain Joe's about to open the drawer and ask that uh, where's my root beer question we're all hoping to avoid. So, uh, in a last-ditch effort to restore the peace, how about I deliver today's answer? The question was this. What is the highest-grossing animated movie of all time? Released this year and grossing over $1.6 billion worldwide, that honor is held by Disney's new version of The Lion King. Come along, Simba. Why don't you follow me over to the washer and dryer and we'll celebrate by sneaking a sip of one of these you-know-whats. Know Know what I mean? See? The Lion King. Hmm. Does that rank among your favorites? Favorite what? (laughs) Favorite animated movies. What? Favorite favorite Snickers bars. I don't know. What what are we talking about here? Favorite kids movie. Favorite animated movie. Uh, Favorite Um, animated movie. I have seen so many flipping Disney movies in my life in the last decade. That, that That's what um, I was going to say. I don't think so. They kind of all run together. I'll be honest. The best one is probably the one that we haven't watched the most recently. You know what I mean? Like we go on these cycles because I have a three-year-old. So yeah, yeah, yeah. like we'll watch Aladdin 77 million times in a row. Actually, we'll watch like parts of Aladdin. Like I want to watch the whole new world section. And like you just watch that on repeat. Aladdin from that era, though, I like a lot better. I like Aladdin better. I like Beauty and the Beast better. I like Mulan better. I never saw Mulan. Moana's good. A Moana? I never liked Moana, and then I watched it you know, yeah. fully, and I'm like, oh, that's actually a good story. Yeah. Coco is the one I really like. Coco's never, fantastic. I never, never saw yeah. it. I think, I think my kids watch that one. That's good stuff. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline, OG, and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency put what you value first. Jasmine? That's right. And a magic carpet. Hard to beat the genie, though. Hard to beat Robin Williams as a genie. Have you seen Aladdin live, like the 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 Broadway? No, but I saw the. You know, we did the review of the new version of Aladdin, and right. and I did like Will Smith doing it. I thought Will Smith did a fine job because he didn't try to be Robin Williams. He did his own thing. Did he? Okay. Yep. So it is your loved ones and your time is their answer. You know, while you're watching Aladdin together, I suppose. It's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now for a free quote. Simple application online, instant coverage decision, affordable prices, and all issued by Mass Mutual, more than 160 year old insurer. Today, we're throwing out the lifeline to our new friend, Stacy. Say hi, Stacy. Hey, Joe and OG. My name is Stacy, and I am one of those digital nomads that everyone probably laughs at, but essentially I am working out of coffee shops and co-working spaces. I was wondering if you had any financial advice for someone that is an American citizen working for an American company, but I'm spending a lot of my time abroad and just like how I budget or what I should be doing, maybe tax or financial wise. I would just love your input. Thanks. Oh man, Stacy, I want to be you. <laughs> My goal. I've had this in the last couple of weeks. A couple of uh, people have, have asked about this. I'm like, go ahead and make me super jealous, but tell me your plan. I'm moving to Mexico for a year. Like, Oh God. <laughs> <I'm> so jealous. <laughs> I know, it's so great. Uh, Stacy, congratulations on being a digital nomad, but OG, what are some special concerns that digital nomads need to, uh, think about? Well, there's a lot of rules about being a U S citizen, but working overseas for a U.S. company as it relates to the taxation and how many days you can spend in the United States, you're going to really want to work with a specialized CPA in this area so that you don't violate anything. As you can imagine, the IRS is very particular about good record keeping in this category in particular. Because if you could just as easily say, yeah, I was uh, out of the country for a while, so I don't owe any taxes. I think a lot of people would do that. So they're very particular about the rules and the definitions of those things. I found out from a client a couple of weeks ago that the day you spend traveling from your away country, I guess back to the United States, also counts as a day in the United States. So you're limited to the amount of time that you can spend in country to qualify for some preferential tax treatment. But even if you spend a day and a half traveling, you know, you're way in 
you know, some other country, Australia or something that's going to take a while to get back home. That counts as a U.S. day. And I just found that really interesting, the, the delineation of that. Imagine if you cut it really close and you were off by a day and that day was a travel day, right. you know, and then you find out that you got it wrong, right? I mean, you could really yes. affect your taxation. So so I think it's really important to work with a knowledgeable uh, CPA tax person on that. Some anecdotal things, I would say, be sure that you're understanding how you're going to access your money. Uh, a lot of banks and custodians for investment accounts really are quite reticent to allow U.S. citizens repeated access to their accounts overseas. We've heard lots of stories of people who log in, you know, they're on a six month trip to Europe and they try to log into their Schwab account and Schwab says, hey, it looks like you're overseas. You've logged in overseas a million times. We're going to close your account. And also, if you're going to try to mitigate that by using local institutions, remember the story that we ran last week about knowing what the rules are around fraud and yeah. the protections that are in place at those institutions as well. Every country has rules. Just learn a little bit about how those work. Yeah. So make sure that you know how you're going to access your money. Make sure that you know how you're going to you know, access cash and that sort of stuff and how you're going to handle that. I saw an article, I don't know, on Flipboard or something about how there's these pop-up ATMs that are in really heavy tourist areas in Europe, but they're not really ATMs. Right. They they dispense cash like an ATM, but it's more of like a money transfer service or something. They've coded it some way so it doesn't have to follow the banking rules. And because you don't know how many how many pounds or how many euros you're supposed to get per dollar, they can go, oh, you want a thousand you want a thousand euros? Great news. Our, our, that's only going to cost you $2,000 plus our 20% transfer fee, <laughs> you know? And, and you know, people are like, okay, I guess that's what it is, you know? And so you have to kind of keep track of that and know how to do that calculation or conversion or go to a reputable place. So you don't get kind of swindled in that regard. And then I think that the other thing that you have to be aware of is, especially with tr when traveling for long periods of time, back to your money in the U.S., how are you going to get money back? You know, if you're going to use local areas, how are you going to get that money back to the United States into your investment accounts? Because just because you're traveling for work or you're a digital nomad does not mean that you should, you know, forego all future savings and that sort of thing. So you want to be aware of how that's going to how that's going to work. If it's possible, if it's not possible, you know, you can't carry suitcases of cash back and forth on airplanes. They really frown on that allegedly. So just some things to think about. I think the biggest piece is going to be to work with a internationally qualified CPA who can guide you through the tax issues. That'll be the biggest bang for your buck, probably. I think another thing to think about uh, cash reserve wise or credit wise is um, if you're a digital nomad, you're probably a little further away from family and the need to travel on a moment's notice might come up. So for that reason, maybe this $2,400 number we talked about today is an adequate reserve. I think having a little bit higher reserve so that you can have money at a moment's notice to, or at least credit at a moment's notice to go do whatever travel you might need to do. If there's some merge scene, you got to get someplace halfway across the globe in a hurry becomes more important. I like that one. Good stuff. Thanks for the question, Stacy. You got a question for the show? Be like Stacy. Take home the greatest money show on earth t-shirt and have OG and I uh, drool about becoming a digital nomad. I I love that idea. The way to do that at stackybenjamins.com forward slash voicemail. Very easy to leave us a message. You just head to that on the browser on your phone, hit the microphone button, bam, you're leaving a message. That's going to do it for today. Thanks a ton for hanging out with us today, everybody. We absolutely love that you take some time out of your busy day to geek out about money topics with us. Thanks to everybody also who's left a review of, of this podcast. Mom has this recent one on the refrigerator from Toadboy135. Not to be confused with Toadboy134 or that loser Toadboy136. Exactly. Now... Toby 135, uh, five stars, great list, and says, common sense, real-world financial discussions, always fun, terrific guests. Easy, succinct, mom digs it. Thanks so much, Toad Boy. If you can leave us a review wherever you listen, maybe it'll find its way to mom's fridge. 
Lastly, if you're looking for better financial help in your corner for 2020, we're already talking 2020. If you want 2020 vision, I'm sure that's going to be like the big marketing thing all year next year with a lot of firms. I have a um, friend of mine who is a financial planner for optometrists. Oh boy. And next year is just going to be, he's just killing it. (laughs) Yes. And every optometrist is going to kill it as well. I'm sure. Probably. I just can't imagine what's going to happen with lens crafters or Warby Parker, or just imagine all the 2020 stuff. But if you want better 2020 vision on your money this coming year, head to stackyvegements.com forward slash OG. And that's how you will move forward with OG and his team for better financial planning. All right. That's going to do it. Doug, take it from here, man. What should we have learned today? Well, Joe, first thing they need to do is take some advice from David Stein. Thinking about investing in something? Write down the answer to the question, what is it? What you don't know can and probably will hurt your results. Second, take some advice from Steve Kerber. Worried about your family and fires? Practice your safety plan and close before you doze. But the big takeaway... Don't accuse OG of stealing the root beers until you question Joe's mom. What, what What's that vanilla ice cream doing on the counter upstairs? Uh, uh, how come there's an empty A&W bottle? There's a spoon in the sink that's been used and a straw in the garbage. So we both know what that means, right? We, uh... We both know that like I'm this this close, this close to putting these clues together into something that makes sense. That's what it means. <sighs> if only there was a smoking gun. Hmm. Big thanks to Steve Kerber from UL for joining us. You'll find more on fire prevention at our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. Thanks also to David Stein for stopping by. It's always good to see David. You'll find his book, Money for the Rest of Us, wherever books are sold. And you'll find his fantastic podcast at moneyfortherestofus.com. This show was created by Joe Salcihai, produced by Richie Rutter-Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes. Not one bit. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remuneration. There's no way you would take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only, and before making any financial moves, consult with a real financial advisor. Oh, gee, check this out. You're never going to believe what happened. So yesterday, I'm riding along in the back of Joe's mom's Harley. And yes, Joe's mom was driving. I mean, it, it, just listen. So we're, we're cruising down the highway, and we get pulled over by a Michigan State trooper. And as he's walking up to the cycle, he pulls out that big, huge notepad to have, right, where they have got all the tickets in there. And as he's doing that, Joe's mom goes, oh, I know what you're going to do. You're going to try to sell me ticket to the Michigan State trooper's ball, aren't you? And he says, ma'am, Michigan State Troopers have no ball. And he says, have a nice day, ma'am. And he shuts his book and walks away. That lady has a way with words. What happened when your house burnt down? Like, what do you remember? I remember a couple of things. So I was a little kid. I was in fourth grade. My brother was in second grade, and he was a little bit of a firebug. It was a Saturday morning. It was in January. We lived in 
mid Michigan. So though it's freezing cold outside and we're sitting out there watching cartoons. And my dad was the type of guy like you that likes to be up for two hours before the sun just cause, you know, and my brother, I don't remember him doing it, but apparently he was lighting popsicle sticks on fire, you know? Oh man. And then putting them, you know, just putting them in the ashtray. My parents are smokers. So they put it in the ashtray. I guess my dad yelled at him or something. So he went upstairs and threw him in the trash can upstairs and then shut the door. So a few moments later, whatever it was, we hear this kind of weird pounding. And uh, my dad yells from the kitchen. My dad was a truck driver. God, stop. You wake your mother up. You know, because it's a Saturday morning. And we look at each other and we're like, I didn't do anything. He, you didn't do anything. What are we yelling at? A few minutes later, he hears doo, doo, pounding again. He's, I tell you, if I have to come out there, you know, we're looking at each other going, we're not doing anything. Like, who's he telling it to? And then we hear it again. And finally, he comes storming. He goes, I told you, if I have to come out here. And then it happens again. He's looking at us. And we're looking at him going, we're not doing anything. And then he realizes the sound's coming from somewhere else. So I kind of got up and out of the couch and I walked around the corner and I could see the smoke billowing down the oh, stairs. Oh, my God. And that's what I went, uh, dad and so turns out the pounding was my mom she was sleeping but semi-conscious you know because of all the smoke she was pounding on the window trying to like break the window open but didn't have any strength or whatever so he goes upstairs grabs mom drags her down the stairs we go sit in the car and um my mom comes running outside and stuck her head in a snowbank i remember that part it was pretty I mean, funny in the whole thing. And uh, so then my dad drives us around the corner, kind of lived as, like just the normal city block, you know, three houses and a block. So we backed out of the drive, we drove around, went to the neighbors, called 911. Fire department comes. They come running up to the house with a big old giant axe, yes. you know, to like chop the door down. And my dad's like, oh, hold on. It's open. <laughs> like we just walked out. Like you don't have to. The house was built in 1892. But like it's, it's a but historical it's their, home. It's their big opportunity, though. <laughs> it's the really cool thing. He's like, oh, hold on. So they go and they take, you know, take care of the fire and they, you know, all that sort of stuff. It was basically the long and the short of it was, was that my brother had been throwing, you know, smoldering popsicle sticks into in the a trash bathroom can. trash can, which, as you can imagine, is full of tissue paper yes. and, you know, whatever. And when he shut the door that just created the environment for it to sit there and, you know, start yeah. on fire. No wind, and then no he, nothing. Nothing. So then he went up there to check on it to make sure everything was okay. And there was a fire in the bathroom and he left the door open and went back downstairs and didn't tell anybody. What the hell? Well, you know, he was eight. So eight year olds tend to do weird things. So we're sitting at the neighbor's house and, um, I remember looking at him and I just kind of, I was like, what did you do? <laughs> He's like, I didn't do anything. Fireman comes in, you know, I'm still impressed by firemen. So I know an eight year old's impressed by firemen. My 10 year old self was impressed by, you know, they got all the gear on. They got the big beard, you know, the, the oxygen tank. And he comes waddling in those captain or whatever. And he kneels down next to my brother and he goes, son, do you have something to say? And like the lowest growliest voice you could imagine. He went right to your brother. Yeah. Maybe at the urging of my parents, like we know it's that one, you know, and he just starts sobbing. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So uh, anyways, the interesting twist on all of this was, was that um, my aunt had also recently had a house fire. I mean, so it was separated by like two weeks. So my aunt and uncle were going through this like same thing, like, oh my gosh, they just had a house fire and they are okay and the family's okay, but the house is destroyed. And then boom, we had one. Other tidbit of information, my, so my aunt, knew, uh, you know, knew what my mom was going through, rushed to the hospital and they're, they're going to do some x-rays with my mom. And they said, um, Hey, are you pregnant? And she goes, no. And they said, okay. And she goes, well, I mean, I guess anything's possible. And they said, well, we should check that first. We can't, you know, x-ray you if you're prego. And so then they found out that she was pregnant with she was. brother, <laughs> not exactly planned. Right. Cause I was 10. My brother was eight. And then here's, you know, little bro, little brother coming. And so um, my aunt, as my mother would tell the story, my aunt is standing in the room going, I'm the first to know. I'm the first to know. As my dad walks in and goes, first to know what? Oh, my. Oh, my God. Really? 
And of course, again, I don't remember dad being ultra excited by the opportunity to, to be a father for the <laughs> time. So now we've got pregnant mom, house destroyed. And the final kind of piece of this was that the, the house fire was on a Saturday. The house insurance was due on Friday. And by the grace of the good Lord, my mom had the wherewithal to make sure that she sent the insurance check that day. Money wasn't really a strong suit in our family. So she had already sent the check on Friday. Oh. And when they called to make the claim, they said, hey, your insurance lapsed on Saturday at midnight, you know, 12.01 a.m. So, you know, we don't have to tell you. And she said, no, I mailed it. So they actually had to wait for the envelope to come in, verify the postmark. The postmark. You know, so it's the, the old school days of of doing it that way before they paid the claim. And it took about... So the fire was in January at the end of the month, and I think everything was back to normal, so to speak, by September, right before my brother was born. Holy cow. Nine months of of that. So it's a slight disruption for a few popsicle sticks. Yeah, exactly. And you'd think he would have learned his lesson, but he did not. I distinctly remember coming home years later from my paper route, and I see like this black billowing smoke coming from behind our house. and And I see my brother running from the front. With the hose going, help! What's he had he raked? Do? He had raked all the leaves behind the garage, and uh, was experimenting with uh, lighter fluid. Because um, what could ever go wrong with that? Yeah, yeah. So the fire department didn't come for that. Although they did come another time. For um, my dad was a big griller, so he would grill every day of the year. It wouldn't matter. And so somebody called the fire department for smoke coming out of the garage, but it was grill smoke. <laughs> So the fire department showed up. They're like, oh, it's you guys again. (laughs) I I made the mistake one time. I had the grill. We had just a little Weber grill. Mm -hmm. We had just purchased our house. And it was this this really old bungalow. So we made some steaks. And it was raining like hell. Started raining just like hell. So I'm right underneath the eaves of my garage, cooking, trying to finish these steaks. I get them done. Don't really know what to do. We got friends over. So I take the grill and I put it inside of my garage and I close the door. A grill that smells like steaks. Mm. And uh, so now, you have a, now you have a garage that smells like steaks. Well, I had a garage infested with raccoons looking for <laughs> the steaks after that. <laughs> nice. We had, uh, when the fire department showed up for the, uh, uh, for the fake fire, uh, it just so happened that we were just, you know, making hamburgers or something. So I, I distinctly remember my dad, you know, the guy's coming running down the driveway, turns the corner with the big hose. <laughs> and my dad's standing there. We're standing there. And he goes, can I help you? And they're like, oh, somebody reported a fire. And he's like, no. Well, you're here. I've got hamburgers. And he goes inside and like gets another whole plate of hamburgers. Did he really? He's grilling hamburgers. They're like, yeah, we're here. Might as well have some hamburgers. So. <laughs> Feeding the fire department. 